Uh, there are over 7.3 million people diagnosed uh, with COVID-19 worldwide and uh, uh, over 400,000 deaths. In the U.S., we're now over 2 million infections and more than 113,000 deaths. Uh, many of us uh, are treating the pandemic less seriously than before. Uh, for example, uh, the Trump administration has not held a COVID White House briefing for a, a month. And yet, uh, the 200,000 new cases over the last seven days in this country means that 10% of the total number of cases were just diagnosed in the last week. Uh, 21 states are having increasing number of infections. 14 states had their highest seven-day average of new cases last week. Uh, on June 10th, uh, the United States had over 25,000 new cases, the highest number since May 21st. And on that same day, California had over 4,300 new cases, uh, the most since the start of the pandemic. And Texas had over 4,100 ca new cases, twice more than the previous daily high. Uh, reports from several states indicate that they are not attributing the rise only to the uh, increased testing or the protests. Uh, due to the increasing availability of tests though, um, experts are recommending looking at two other metrics to assess whether the pandemic is worsening. One is the percent of positive tests, not just the absolute number. And the other is the number of hospitalizations for COVID. We know that the number of hospitalized patients for COVID has been increasing in the following states, Texas, North and South Carolina, California, Oregon, Arkansas, Mississippi, Utah, and Arizona. In Arizona, the report is that already 76% of the ICU beds are occupied. Uh, all of this suggests that there is uh, certainly, uh, at least in, in some states, uh, a rising uh, problem with the pandemic and possibly with the capacity of the state to handle uh, the increasing number. A modeling paper just published this week showed that the widespread use of face masks can reduce a transmission rate or the RE number to below one, which is a crit critical criterion for slowing down the epidemic. Uh, I and others think that the combination of relaxing the stay at home rules and inadequate number of people wearing masks or respecting social distancing are probable causes of the rise in the number of infections. Um, on the treatment and vaccine front, uh, a, a large randomized controlled trial showed no beneficial effect for hydroxychloroquine in patients with severe COVID-19. The results were so persuasive that the research team stopped the study early. So I think right now the available data suggests that hydroxychloroquine does not work for patients with mild symptoms or severe symptoms. Nursing homes, uh, it's been really the epicenter uh, of the pandemic. Uh, over 210,000 cases and 43,000 deaths have occurred in nursing homes or other long-term care facilities. As of May 28th, uh, 26 states had at least 50% of their COVID deaths occurring in long-term care facilities. Uh, one study up until mid-May of uh, over 9,000 nursing homes found that a third of the nursing homes had at least one COVID infection. Uh, one fifth of nursing homes still report they have less than one week of personal protective equipment or PPE left. Uh, part of this has been attributed to delays in the delivery of the PPEs promised by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and FEMA. Nursing home residents only represent 0.6% of the U.S. population and yet they are about 40% of all the deaths in the United States. And uh, we have to think about the background about nursing homes to begin with. Uh, for the last 20 years, there have been serious quality of care problems in nursing homes. And about 70% of all nursing homes are for-profit and they're trying to make money. Uh, by cutting the staffing levels, by keeping the wages, benefits low, and um, not providing health insurance. And we know that before the virus hit, three-fourths of all the nursing homes in the U.S. had inadequate registered nurse uh, staffing levels. 
and 63% had infection control violations. So uh, then when the um, virus hit, uh, it definitely has spread like wildfire through nursing homes. And we uh, just, you heard about one study that was done, uh, but we have a new study that has just been uh, finished for California, looking at nursing homes that were more likely to get the COVID virus. And we know that if they had low registered nurse staffing, they were twice as likely to get the virus. And if they had low quality of care, uh, and they were large in size. They were much more likely to get the virus. And once the virus is in the facility, it can spread rapidly because so many staff and so many residents, possibly as much as 50%, are asymptomatic. And so we've had very inadequate testing in nursing homes. Uh, the testing has primarily just been done when there was a big outbreak. When we, in fact, know, and we've known from the beginning that we should have been testing all staff and all residents because of the number that are asymptomatic. So the state and um, government and nationally finally have ordered testing for all residents but it's taking a long time to, to roll out the testing. Also, there was problems with not reporting adequately, not requiring nursing homes to report the infection rates and the death rates. Um, we also know that minorities uh, are more likely to be placed in nursing homes with the poorest quality of care with the lowest staffing and the most efficiencies. And of course, many of the staff who work in nursing homes are from minority groups. And uh, they are at very high risk because of the, the lack of testing and the lack of, of uh, masks and gowns and PPEs. The nursing home workers especially nursing assistants, receive very low pay and they have, generally have no sick leave. So they're reluctant to stay home when they're sick. Uh, and they also usually don't have health insurance. And so because of the, of the low pay, many of them are actually uh, living under poverty rates and are eligible for food stamps. And so they, commonly work more than one job. And so then that we know from uh, the studies by the CDC has helped spread the virus from uh, across different facilities. And especially because many of them don't know that they have the virus because they don't have symptoms. So this is a perfect storm uh, for uh, nursing home residents and staff to contact the virus and it's continuing to spread because of the slow testing and the slow use of PPE and the poor policies and the poor oversight by the government. So I think it's a, and we do have an important opportunity to try to understand the problems of nursing homes and to make some policy corrections in the future that will prevent infections and uh, help us address this current emergency crisis. Uh, 20 states have already granted nursing homes immunity. And part of that is based on this narrative that is being put out by the nursing home industry that they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. They didn't have anything to do with this infection spreading. And yet we know that's not true. Uh, many of the worst outbreaks have been in these worst homes. And there's definitely been negligence involved in many cases. And it, it's not only a shortage of the testing and masks, but 
I think negligence with a lack of staff and uh, infection control. So I'm very opposed to granting, granting immunity. If, if they can take the uh, family members home, that would be the best thing they could do. But in many circumstances, they, they're unable to do that. Right now, we're very um, upset about the um, restrictions on the visitation policies for family members. We are uh, trying to organize to demand that the governors let family members go back into the nursing homes. Of course, they need to wear a mask and gowns and, and be careful. Uh, but they need, we need to have them in there helping the residents and being able to communicate with them because we know residents are uh, grossly affected by the loneliness, the isolation, and the lack of staff. They're not getting good care. They're not being helped with eating and uh, drinking. And some of them are dying of de dehydration and other problems. So we need the residents, the family members, back into the facilities. Um, I want to just give you a very brief uh, overview of how this current pandemic affects depression. There are really two ways. One of them is the social isolation that we know is a risk factor for depression. And uh, I think this is something that uh, Dr. Harrington alluded to when she was talking about the, the elderly in nursing homes. And the second is depression that is actually caused by the virus. So in the first situation, it's not people who are actually infected, but it's individuals who, because of the virus, actually have to remain in social isolation. So the impact of social isolation can be a, a quite devastating in many ways. The idea that you're worried about what, the, uh, what form the illness might take and your concerns about infecting other people the problem is particularly acute among the elderly because sometimes they might be in, in, in um, um, nursing homes where this became particularly problematic. But because the elderly are among the highest risk group for contracting the virus as well as the most severe effects, they were asked to specifically self-isolate. So this problem is very acute among uh, this population. It is a very serious health concern because studies after studies have shown that uh, social isolation increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, so heart attacks and strokes. It increases uh, the, the symptoms of autoimmune diseases if, if these individuals have autoimmune diseases. And of course, it, it uh, increases mental health issues especially uh, depression and anxiety. So with respect to social isolation due to this current pandemic, there's very little evidence. We simply don't have the kind of data on mental health outcomes that we do on things such as mortality and, and, and cardiovascular disease, for example. That data is still being collected and it's still emerging. So what some authors have done is they've tried to compare what happened in the previous pandemics. So for example, this would be the um, Middle Eastern uh, virus as well as the previous SARS virus, which occurred in 2002. And what this showed is that patients, that, that individuals who were, were at, uh, went through these times had a much higher incidence of anxiety and depression. So there are some things that we are learning from other pandemics, not particularly from this one itself. That data is still emerging. But we do have sort of a perfect storm because of individuals who've had to isolate themselves. So what exactly does social isolation do? If you think about it, social isolation is you're not particularly um, uh, uh, affected by the virus at the time. You're simply not interacting with people. What does that do to your physiology and how is that linked to depression? So what does it do to you? It increases the levels of certain hormones like cortisol, which is a stress hormone. It weakens your immune system. 
people who are socially isolated tend to have a higher risk of infections and part of it is because their immune system doesn't cope as well with the, um, any kind of passing bug as it were. And among the uh, elderly, this is particularly a problem because they are already um, disadvantaged because they have a change in their basal inflammation as it were. So social isolation can have very dramatic impacts. And then the actual virus itself. When you get the virus, the first thought was, well, this is SARS, right? This is severe acute respiratory disorder. What we're now noticing is that there are a whole array of mental health issues that are occurring, including depression, including cognitive changes, memory changes, um, and people essentially feeling overwhelmed. So this is a broad basket of mental health issues. I don't know if many of you all remember the uh, uh, reporting of Chris Cuomo when he himself had the virus. He spoke uh, very eloquently about the demons coming out at night. And this was the depression that the virus brings. So how does a respiratory virus, one that affects your lungs, affect your brain and your mood? And uh, it's a very interesting connection. The route by which the virus enters your body is through your nose. And the nose is actually somewhat exposed to the brain, right? And, and so the virus can actually end up in the brain, especially in a particular portion called the olfactory system. And the olfactory system, which is basically how we smell things, is very, very strongly implicated with depression. So now you have a virus that can enter into the brain and affect an area that we know is implicated with depression. The other thing it does is that once you have the virus, you can have a full-blown inflammation. You have these proteins called cytokines that are uh, going to try to actually help resolve the virus, but they do it in a uh, sort of a slash and burn manner. They're going to start killing off cells. They're, they're going to affect things besides just the virus infected cells. As a result, people will experience depression because of the inflammation that occurs. You see this very often with other inflammation type diseases, such as stroke, such as other types of viral infections. So I'll stop over here. I just wanted to make two points. And one is depression without the virus because of social isolation and depression with the virus because of how it affects the brain. One of the big symptoms of the disease is clotting and it causes blood clots, which means that now any organ in which these clots occur will result in a different type of symptom. So you have individuals, as you mentioned, young people coming into ER with a stroke. They don't have any of the lung infection. They don't have the cough, they don't have the temperature, but they have a stroke, perfectly healthy individuals. Um, the, other, the other symptom that became very popular a few weeks ago was uh, these, these black toes. Again, that's part of the clotting response. So yes, it, it, the, 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 inability, the, the clotting itself can uh, make this disease very hard to diagnose because you, it will, the symptoms will depend on which organ is being affected. Have the elderly close by. Don't isolate them try to get them out of situations where they will not have adequate care and they will not see loved ones. Now, there are a few other things that individuals could do. Um, if there's access to uh, platforms like, like Zoom, for example, it's possible to see people and get some of your interaction that way, which is also helpful. The other things to pay attention to are, are diet and exercise because the, the social isolation gets everybody to the point where you, where you get less disciplined about your life because you're not out there meeting people. And I've been reading somewhat hilarious reports from my colleagues about how showering is a thing of the past. But the reality is we need to hang on to routine. We need to eat well. Uh, as Henrietta pointed out a minute ago, uh, the disease affects many things, including the gut. So good nutrition, good hydration is going to be critical. Let me kind of frame my comments by saying that this terrible pandemic has revealed just the tremendous disparities that have been in this society for not just 
months or years, but for many decades. And here we're talking about how this country in particular has allowed social, economic, and uh, educational disparities to widen in society to a point now where we have created tremendous differences in who's at risk and who is not. Uh, certainly one variable that is increasingly being used to really bring out these disparities is zip codes. But we also have to add race and ethnicity as well as age. So uh, the first thing is to just reemphasize what public health uh, experts have always referred to, the social determinants of health. It's no, it's no longer just whether or not you have access to health insurance or medical care, but it's really about the combined impact of poor housing, low income, low educational levels, racial and ethnic disparities. And I bring all that out not to continue to create a somber view of what this pandemic means for older adults, but to bring out some of the hopeful silver linings that the pandemic has really identified and made visible to the public at large, to elected officials, to federal, state, and local govern, government bodies, that we now are in, are in a desperate situation where hopefully from the pandemic, we can begin to revisit our regulatory, legislative, and policy approaches to begin to change these things and to begin to address these tremendous disparities which have put older adults but also different groups at risk. And in that regard, let me address the policy front. Uh, uh, we've seen a resurgence of what we refer to as ageism and ableism, discrimination based on age and disability in different parts of the country. And as a member of uh, the governor's master plan on aging, uh, we worked very closely with the Department of Public Health and Aging and the governor's office because initially a few weeks as the state prepared for a potential resurgence and scarce uh, medical care and ventilators, they tried to sort out who would get priority if there weren't sufficient uh, medical services. And the initial proposals to our great consternation was to in fact ration these services based on a point system that would give preferential use for these scarce resources to younger folks, those who were assumed to have a longer life expectancy, and those without pre-existing medical conditions. That would have targeted directly those who are older, those who have uh, various types of disabilities, and would have put them at the back of the line, so to speak, a clear example of ageism and, uh, ageism and ableism. The good news, after pushing back advocacy, working closely with the governor's office, they completely turned it around and their new care standards for uh, potential medical resurgence of this virus is to ensure that there is no discrimination based on age and disability. I mentioned that first, it's kind of good news, we're able to turn things around. But also because in this pandemic, as we talk about social isolation and social determinants of health, we have to be very cognizant that there is sadly discrimination based on age and disability, and we have to work against that. Our new front in terms of public policy is working closely with the state legislature, the state senate, and the governor's office. Given the economic impact of the pandemic, uh, the governor and the state are having to face major cutbacks in all areas of social, public health, and educational services. And uh, right now, we're working with the governor because some of the initial proposals were dramatic reductions in the very programs that allow older persons to remain at home. Major cutbacks in in-home supportive services, adult day health care centers, Alzheimer's support services, and so now our current efforts with our master plan on aging group, with our fellow advocates, is to educate, inform the state legislature, 
work with the governor's office to minimize the impact on the various home and community-based services without which would force many older adults to go back into skilled nursing facilities, institutional care. And we now know why that is not the preferred outcome. So at the moment, we're addressing the issues of uh, ensuring we don't have discrimination and trying to restore some of these cutbacks. I'm hoping that the silver lining in all this is that the state legislature, the taxpayers, the governors, and the nation will begin to understand that what we really need out of this pandemic is a federal and state commitment to a dramatic expansion in home and community-based long-term care to ensure that we have the technology to minimize social isolation for those that have to minimize social interaction and hopefully to educate younger populations that they too will be old someday. They too will face a variety of physical limitations and disabilities. So our hope is that there might be a national reawakening that age matters, that disability matters, and that we are all at risk of the implications of this terrible pandemic. A little bit about the Downtown Women's Center. We have been, uh, for the last 40 years, the only organization exclusively focused on serving women experiencing homelessness. So we've really gotten to see the trajectory of homelessness um, over the decades. Um, and a little bit about the context of homelessness. Presently, um, our most recent homeless count showed um, that there has been a 20% increase in the older adult population experiencing homelessness. And while for the general population, it's been a 13% increase, for women, it's been a 16% increase. So again, specifically disproportionately affecting older adult women. Um, and just across the US, we've seen this ongoing trend um, of this uptick in terms of who's experiencing homelessness um, being over the age of 50. And um, in the Skid Row community in particular, about 50% of the folks experiencing homelessness as well as 50% of the folks that we serve are also over the age of 50. Um, and this is particularly relevant for uh, women because we see that women experiencing homelessness are aging approximately 20 years faster than their housed counterparts. Um, and in terms of the con most contributing factor to homelessness, it's really about income inequities. And women over the age of 65 are experiencing poverty rates, um, or women of color over the age of 65 are experiencing poverty rates that are almost double that of white women. Um, and then women of color also have about one-tenth of the assets um, of white women. And you know, there's lots of factors that contribute to income inequity, but again, we know that people of color are disproportionately impacted um, with Latina women being the lowest earning demographics at about 40, 47% of what's earned by white men. Um, and then just general gender discrimination and women's vulnerability to age discrimination in employment. Uh, women are also the most likely to be caregivers and this can result in gaps in employment, um, fewer years uh, in which to build resumes, fewer years in which to build assets or pensions. Um, and women with children earn about 28 times less than women without children. Um, so really significant um, and also, you know, really important work, but not appropriately compensated. Um, also among uh, folks experiencing homelessness, um, you heard a little bit about the social determinants of health. Um, and these uh, really correlate to the factors that cause homelessness. Um, so we're starting from a place of, um, you know, folks experiencing these multifaceted uh, factors that both contribute to their homelessness and then also contribute to their uh, adverse outcomes later in life. Um, and then also really of note is that uh, women experiencing homelessness actually have shorter life expectancies than men. So in the general house population, we know that women typically uh, live to be about 83 years and housed men is about 79 years um, compared to the life expectancies of women who've experienced homelessness uh, being at about 48 years compared to 51 years for men experiencing homelessness. So um, again, the experience of being unsheltered really takes a physical toll. Um, 
also less likely to be able to carry out their activities of daily living. Um, and also, we also see that women who are about 45 years or older pay 27.5% uh, more for health exp expenses compared to male counterparts. Um, some additional factors before I talk a little bit more about how uh, coronavirus has exacerbated all of these, um, you know, domestic violence being one of them um, and that disproportionately affecting women. Um, we know that uh, coronavirus really um, exacerbated domestic violence, women being trapped in homes with perpetrators, um, and then women experience domestic violence six times more often um, in low income households than in high income households. So in terms of how these factors um, have, you know, interfaced uh, to cause homelessness, um, you know, they all are impacted by affordable housing. Um, many people experiencing homelessness start from a place of social isolation, which we've heard about how um, this is further exacerbated later in life. Um, and even before coronavirus, we were facing this public health crisis um, that really would just laid bare uh, how bad it can, can could get with this type of a pandemic. Um, you know, we saw folks that were unable to shelter in place, um, and many folks were in congregate care settings, which increased their levels of vulnerability. Um, folks experiencing homelessness were in the top three prioritization for risk, but being in the top three meant not getting uh, proper PPE um, and resources at the same rate as like hospitals and first responders, for example. Um, the increase in food insecurity for folks who were already experiencing food insecurity, inability to go to um, food pantries and places where, um, you know, normal food would have been obtained. Um, Again, disproportionate job loss for women in service industry types of jobs. Um, and then those with jobs are often frontline workers who could not work remotely. Um, and then the limited capacity to practice social distancing, physical distancing. Um, and so in response to this, the homeless services sector focused on uh, what some folks may have heard of, a project called Project Room Key, um, which was created to house the folks who were most vulnerable to loss of life if they contracted COVID. Um, and the eligibility criteria for this was based on being age 65 or older or having a pre-existing condition. Um, so it really started as a way to decompress shelters and congregate living situations um, to help increase physical distancing. Um, and it progressively opened up to other folks who were generally unsheltered. Um, and it consisted of homeless service providers taking over the operations of hotels, providing 24-hour staffing, uh, meals, on-site nurses, uh, doctors, health, uh, mental health, and case management. Um, and it was made, made available initially for 90 days um, through FEMA funding, but as the clock has been ticking down, the pressure is really on to house the folks that are um, in room key. So, um, you know, that's really the focus of the homeless services sector, recognizing that this most vulnerable population is going to, um, you know, not have this resource imminently. Um, sadly, uh, women have been disproportionately impacted by the job loss, um, as well as um, continuing to have some of the lowest earning jobs. And so, um, you know, even though these rent moratoriums were in place, what's going to end up happening is people who weren't earning income during this period of time were not saving money to be able to pay um, this rent that's going to come due. So uh, we're very concerned about that um, and, you know, really what those outcomes are going to look like for women. Uh, women who are sheltered get housed within a few years normally, and women who are unsheltered can take up to 16 years to house. Um, and one of the things that happens that's particularly significant is the exposure to violence that women experience and the resulting trauma and how that affects mental health. Um, and so even compared to unsheltered men, which is about five years, so really vast differences there. Um, and, but in this, setting, you know, there's a big question about is exposure to violence and elements worse than being exposed to coronavirus? And I think that that really depends and it depends on the shelter settings. Um, some shelter settings are uh, rooms with a couple people. Some shelters, um, you know, we, we operate a bridge housing program um, that is an open space with 24 beds. And so that's, um, you know, a lot more exposure.